بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما إن شاء الله today we will pick up, pick up where we left off last week we were talking about the tenth year of the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this year is also known as the Amul Huzn or the year of sadness. Because during that year, many events happened in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that were very painful and that were very difficult. He lost his uncle Abu Talib who had protected him for the last 10 years from the harm of the Quraysh. He lost his wife Khadija radiallahu anha who was the first person who believed in him and who was a constant source of support for him for 25 years. That year he also tried to extend the da'wah to the city of Ta'if. He went to Ta'if and he hoped that those people would be receptive to the call of Islam. But instead of being receptive to the call of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the people of Ta'if threw stones at him until he bled. So you can see that it was a very difficult year for him. And when he was trying to go back to Mecca, when he left Ta'if after they didn't listen to what he had to say, when he tried to re-enter Mecca, the Quraysh or the leaders of the Quraysh, they prevented him from entering until he finally found someone who would take him under his protection and bring him into Mecca. And that was Mut'im ibn Adi. And he felt that it was a dishonorable thing for the Quraysh not to let one of their own people come back into his own city. So even though Mut'im ibn Adi was not a Muslim himself, he felt that what the Quraysh was doing was very dishonorable. And he accepted the request of the Prophet wasallam to allow him to enter Mecca under his wing, under his protection. So he went back into Mecca. So look at this. So many difficult things happened to him within this year. The loss of his uncle, the loss of his wife, the treatment that he received in Ta'if, and then the treatment he was receiving from his own people in Mecca. So a very difficult time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him some consolation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him some gifts after these incidents happened and that was as a consolation for the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So even though he had to go through this pain and these tragedies and this difficulty, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala continued to give him the gift of hope. So one of the beautiful things that happened during this year is the incident that is mentioned in the Quran of the acceptance of Islam by a group of jinns. The acceptance of Islam by a group of jinns. And the story is recounted in the Quran in Surah Al Jinn itself and also in Surah Al Ahqaf. So, what is the background for this story? The Prophet ﷺ, once in a while, he used to like to go out into the desert and pray in the open land. Instead of praying at home, he would like to go sometimes out in the middle of the desert, you know, in the open land and pray there in the night. So one night he decided to do that and he was accompanied by the great companion Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, they're walking into the desert and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam tells Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, just sit here, stay here. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he listens to the instruction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he sits in that place. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam moves a bit forward. He moves along while Abdullah is sitting in that place. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started to pray. And when he started to pray, he started to recite the Quran. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he's keeping a watchful eye out. They're in the middle of an open expanse of land and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was afraid for the safety of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam so he's making sure that he keeps a close eye on what's going on to make sure that nobody comes and nobody tries to hurt the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam so Abdullah was keeping a close watch on him 
a group of people came suddenly towards the Prophet Sallallahu and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud found these people to be strange he didn't know where they were from he didn't know who they were but a group of people suddenly came to the Prophet Sallallahu came towards him while he was praying so Abdullah got up and he was ready to run over there to defend the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he didn't know who these people were he didn't know what they wanted to do but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam signaled him from his hand don't worry stay where you are so Abdullah ibn Mas'ud stayed and he didn't continue to move forward more and more and more of these strange people started coming and crowding around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to an extent where Abdullah ibn Mas'ud couldn't even see where the Prophet Sallallahu was anymore. That many people suddenly surrounded him. And this was actually a group of jinns who heard the recitation of the Prophet Sallallahu and they found it very amazing and they wanted to hear what it was. So they came to listen to the recitation of the Prophet Sallallahu These jinns were from a village, a village called Nusaybin. And the jinns, you know, they have their own communities, they have their own villages, they have their places where they live as well. So they were from the village of Nusaybin and they heard this recitation. They wanted to know what it was. They came to the source of the recitation, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they crowded around to listen to it. And they were amazed by it. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala recounts this in the Quran. In Surah Al-Jinn, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, قُلْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا يَهْدِي إِلَى الرُّشْدِ فَآمَنَّا بِهِ وَلَنْ نُشْرِكَ بِرَبِّنَا أَحَدًا وَأَنَّهُ تَعَالَى جَدُّ رَبِّنَا مَتَّخَذَ صَاحِبَةً وَلَا وَلَدًا وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقُولُ سَفِيهُنَا عَلَى اللَّهِ شَطَطًا so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is recounting the story of these jinns who came and listened to the Qur'an. When they heard the recitation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they said, Inna sami'na Qur'anan ajaba. We have, we have heard an amazing Qur'an. We have heard some amazing recitation. Yahdi ila rushdi And what was being recited, it guides to the correct path. It guides to a path of straightness so when we heard it we believed in it and we will never associate any partners with our Lord and they realized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is high exalted over taking any wife or partner or son Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alone and there is no one besides him and he has no associate and no partner and no one is worthy of worship besides him now these jinns after hearing the recitation of the quran they became muslims but before that they were disbelievers and why were they disbelievers because because the foolish one amongst us our foolish leader used to make up lies about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And who, who was the leader of the jinns? That was Iblis himself. So Iblis would lie about Allah. Iblis would tell his people to commit shirk. And they listened to him. And the reason why the jinns listened to Iblis is because the aql of the jinns or the reasoning or the understanding capability of the jinns, it's not as strong as the understanding capability of a human being. The human being is the greatest creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of its ability to understand and think. And the jinns, they also have the ability to understand and think, but their ability is not to the level of a human being. And one of the proofs of, the, of that is the statement of the jinns as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran and we believed that no one would ever make up a lie about Allah no human being and no jinn would ever make up a lie about Allah they couldn't comprehend that that 
how can someone lie about Allah? How can someone make up a lie about Allah? They're, they weren't able to comprehend that the fact that someone could actually make up a lie about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. So that was something that shocked them. And this is exactly what the Iblis did. He lied about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they believed it because they said no one is going to make up a lie about Allah. So what he's saying, it must be true. So they believed what the Iblis told them. But when they heard the recitation of the Quran, then they realized that they were in the wrong. And then they started calling Iblis, the one who they were previously listening to, they, call, they called him the Safi, the fool. And the fool from amongst us, that's Iblis, the Safi. He used to make up lies about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when they heard this recitation, the recitation of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa of the Quran, they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they accepted Islam, a big group of jinns. Walhamdulillah. And there were so many of them listening to the recitation of the Quran that they were almost having to climb on top of each other so that they would have room to listen to the Prophet ﷺ. Just try to imagine it. The Prophet ﷺ in the middle of a big piece of land reciting the Quran. A large number of jinns around him. Everyone wants to hear what he's saying. And it's so crowded that they have to actually be on top of each other almost. Almost climbing on top of each other to get close enough to listen to that recitation. Imagine this. SubhanAllah. وَأَنَّهُ لَمَّا قَامَ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ يَدْعُوهُ كَادُوا يَكُونُونَ عَلَيْهِ لبدا. And when the servant of Allah, the slave of Allah, Abdullah, that is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he stood calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reciting the Qur'an, كَادُوا يَكُونُونَ عَلَيْهِ لبدا. They were so crowded around him that they were almost climbing on each other to listen to that beautiful recitation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these jinns, they accepted Islam. They heard the Quran and they accepted Islam. Not only did they accept Islam, they went back to their people and became da'is. They, they started calling their people to Islam. Ya qawmana ajibu da'i Allahi wa aminu bihi yaghfir lakum min dhunubikum wa yujirkum min azabin ali. They went back to their people and they said, Ya qawmana ajibu da'i Allah. O oh people, our people. Listen to the call and answer the call of the one who calls to Allah and believe in him. You will be forgiven for your sins and you will be saved from a painful punishment. So the jinns, they accepted Islam and they went back to their people and they became da'wah workers of Islam. Subhanallah. So this was one of the beautiful gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after he went through so many difficulties during that year. The Islam of the jinns, walhamdulillah. The other beautiful incident, or one of the other beautiful incidents that took place in that year was the acceptance of Islam by the Najashi. And remember, previously we spoke about the hijrah to Habasha. The Prophet wasallam was sending groups of Muslims to Abyssinia, to Habasha, which is modern-day Ethiopia, because in that land there was a king, there was a ruler, and he was known as the Najashi. And he was known for his justice. He was not a Muslim, he was a Christian, but he was known to be a man of justice. And the reason why the Prophet ﷺ sent the Muslims to live under him was because he knew that they would be treated fairly under the Najashi. So a group of Muslims or a large number of Muslims had actually made that migration to Habasha. There were actually more Muslims in Habasha than there were in Mecca. The 10th year of Hijrah, I'm sorry, the 10th year of the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were about 150 Muslims total. 80 of them in Habasha and 70 in Mecca. So most of the Muslims actually were there in Habasha. So the Quraysh, they got afraid of this. They said, look, if the numbers of Muslims in Habasha keep increasing, they are going to organize themselves over there. They're going to become powerful over there. And once they have enough power, they're going to come back to Mecca and take over. 
and they will unseat us from our positions of power. So they had this fear that the Muslims in Habasha, they were going to become powerful and once they reached a certain number and once they reached a certain level of strength, they would come back to Mecca and they would, they would overtake the positions of the leaders of the Kuffar of the Quraysh. So they became scared about this and they thought that they need to prevent this from happening. And the way they wanted to go about doing that was to actually send a couple of representatives of the Quraysh to Habasha to talk to the Najashi and convince him to surrender the Muslims and allow them to take them back to Mecca. So this was the plan of the Quraysh. So the two representatives they decided to send were a man named Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah and Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As later on he became a Muslim, alhamdulillah, but at that time he was not. So Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah and Amr ibn al-As were the two representatives chosen by the Quraysh to go to Habasha and convince the Najashi to turn over the Muslims to them so that they could take them back to Mecca and continue in their oppression of the Muslims. So when the Quraysh decided to send these two representatives to Habasha, they didn't send them empty-handed. They wanted to send them with lavish gifts for the Najashi. So that if they thought that if we, you know, if, if we give them these gifts, then it will be more likely that he will accept what we have to say and he will send the Muslims back with us. So they found out what was the most beloved type of gift to the Najashi. And the Najashi, he liked skins. He liked these animal skins. That was something that he loved. So they said, okay, we're going to get the best quality animal skins. There were very high quality animal skins that used to come from Sham, from Syria. So they, they loaded a bunch of those in their, in their belongings and they went off to Habasha with these gifts. So when they arrived in Habasha, before talking to the Najashi, they decided to first talk with the religious establishment of Habasha. And these people were known as the Batariqa. And the Batariqa, they were basically the religious rulers of the land. And they were very powerful politically as well. And the Najashi himself, he was actually one of them. And then he was appointed to be the king. So he was actually one of the religious leaders. He had knowledge of the Injil. He had knowledge of Christianity. And eventually he was appointed to become the ruler. So the religious establishment, these Batariqa, they were very powerful politically and socially as well. So Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah and Amr ibn al-As, they said, okay, let's talk to these people first. Let's just get a feel of what they're thinking. And then we can speak with them first and arrange after that a meeting with the Najashi himself. So that's what they decided to do. So they talked to these religious establishment people. They talked to these religious authorities, the Batariqa, and they gave them some of the gifts too. They gave them some of the skins and they talked to them and they said, you know, these are the people who, who you are housing, the people who you accepted as refugees. They are actually criminals. They are people who caused a lot of corruption in our land. And then when we wanted to punish them, they just ran off, they escaped. So we really want you to send them back with us so we can punish them and give them the punishment that they deserve. So these Batariqa, they said, yeah, okay, if you want to take them back, we don't have any problem with that. And they were very happy. Abdullah and Amr ibn al-As, they were very happy. And they thought that basically most of their work is done. But still, they had to get it approved by the Najashi himself. So these Batariqa, these religious authorities, they set up a meeting between Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah and Amr ibn al-As and the Najashi. So when they went and they actually met with the Najashi and they made their request to him that please send these people back, the Najashi said, no way. They came to me specifically instead of going to any other land. They came to me specifically because 
They trusted me that I would take care of them and that I would be just with them and that I would be fair with them. You think I'm just going to surrender them to you like that? Just because you tell me to do it? No. And they tried to reason with him. They said, look, these people, they are people who made corruption in the land and they are criminals and they're trying to escape justice. So the Najashi, and as we mentioned before, and as the Prophet ﷺ said that he is a man that no one is dealt with unjustly under him. He is a man of justice. So he proved that he was a man of justice in this situation as well. He said, okay, you're saying what you are saying, but I'm not going to make a judgment just based on hearing one side of the story. You can say what you want to say, but I cannot, I cannot just send them with you without hearing their side of the story as well. And now Amr ibn al-As, he's not happy. He didn't want it to become a confrontation. He didn't want the Muslims to have their say in front of the Najashi as well. Because he knew in his heart that what they were doing was wrong. So the Najashi called for the Muslims to come forward to present their side of the argument as well. And the Muslims chose Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, the brother of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. The Muslims chose Ja'far to be their spokesman, to speak on their behalf. So the Najashi, he said, look, these people have come. They want me to surrender you to them so that they can take you back to Mecca. And they are saying this and this and this about you. So you go ahead and speak. I want to hear your side of the story. So Ja'far, he said, we were a lost people. We were people who used to worship idols. We worshiped stones. We committed all sorts of acts of immorality. We were involved in all sorts of sinful behavior. We used to cut off the ties of kinship. We did so many bad things. And then a man from amongst us came to guide us. And this man is a man who was always known for his integrity and his truthfulness and his honesty. And he taught us not to worship stones, but rather to worship the creator of all of the worlds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, and not to associate partners with him. He taught us to keep good relations with our family. He taught us to have good manners. He taught us to leave acts of immorality. He refined our character. And we followed him and we believed in him. And the Najashi, he was very impressed with what Ja'far had to say. And he realized that the characteristics of this man that Ja'far is describing, these are the characteristics of a prophet, of a person who receives revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we mentioned, the Najashi was a knowledgeable man. He was a Christian who had knowledge of the scripture of Christianity. He had knowledge of the Injil. So he realized that the description of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that Ja'far is mentioning, it's similar to the other prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent down. So the Najashi was touched, he was affected by the words of Ja'far. And he said, do you have anything from the revelation that he receives? Can I hear some of the revelation that he receives? And Ja'far said, yes, sure. Let me recite it to you. Now Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu an very 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 smart which ayat did he choose to recite in front of the najashi remember the najashi is a christian so the najashi he believes in the prophets that came before the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and who were the later prophets that came they were isa alayhi salam zakaria alayhi salam yahya alayhi salam so christians they know about these prophets. They're very familiar with these prophets. So Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, he decides to recite Surah Maryam, which has the story of Zakariya alayhi salam and Yahya alayhi salam. So he starts reading. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Kaf ha ya صاد ذكر رحمة ربك عبده زكريا إذ نادى ربه نداء خفيا قال رب إني 
وهنى العظم مني واشتعل الرأس شيبا واشتعل الرأس شيبا ولم أكن بدعائك رب شقيا وإني خفت الموالي من ورائي وكانت امرأتي عاقرا فهب لي من لدنك وليا يرثني ويرث من آل يعقوب واجعله رب رضيا يا زكريا يا زكريا إنا نبشرك بغلام اسمه يحيى اسمه يحيى لم نجعل له من قبل سميا قال رب أنا يكون لي غلاما وكانت امرأتي عاقرا وقد بلغت من الكبر عتيا قال كذلك قال ربك هو علي هين وقد خلقتك من قبل ولم تك شيئا قال رب اجعل لي آية قال آيتك ألا تكلم الناس ثلاث ليال سويا فخرج على قومه من المحراب فأوحى إليهم أن سبحوا بكرة وعشيا يا يحيى خذ الكتاب بقوة وآتيناه الحكم صبيا وحنانا من لدنا وزكاه وكان تقيا وبرا بوالديه ولم يكن جبارا عصيا وسلام عليه يوم ولد ويوم يموت ويوم يبعث حيا So he recited these beautiful ayat of Surah Maryam regarding Zakaria alayhi salam and Yahya alayhi salam and the Najashi was very, very deeply affected by this. And he said, Wallahi, Wallahi, these words and the words that were revealed to Isa alayhi salam, they come from the same source. These words and the words of the Injil, they come from the same source. So he was deeply, deeply affected by the recitation of the Quran. And then the Najashi, after hearing both sides of the story now, he said to the Muslims, you can go, you are safe in my land and I will not let anyone touch you. And then he said to Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah and Amr ibn al-As, get out of my land. I am not sending them with you. They are safe with me. So Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah and Amr ibn al-As, they were dejected. They were very sad that the whole purpose of this trip was not going to be fulfilled. So Amr ibn al-As didn't want to go back to Mecca empty-handed. So he wanted to give it one more try. He wanted to give it one more try. So he went back to those batariqa, to those religious authorities. And he said, you know, I need another meeting with the Najashi. Because he doesn't know one thing about those Muslims. Those Muslims, they slander Isa alayhi salam and his mother, Maryam. They speak badly about Isa and Maryam. He made up this lie. So when the Batariqa, when they informed the Najashi about this, the Najashi again, he decided to call the Muslims to hear what they had to say. So Amr ibn al-As and Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah are there and Najashi calls the Muslims again. And again, they appoint Ja'far ibn Abi Talib to speak on their behalf. So the Najashi said that, you know, these guys are saying that you speak badly about Isa alayhi salam and his mother Maryam. And the reason why Amr ibn al-As tried to make this type of fitna was because he knew that they were Christians. And he knew the Christians, they have high respect for Isa alayhi salam and Maryam alayhi salam. But we Muslims, of course, we have high respect for them as well. But Amr ibn al-As, he wanted to make some type of a wedge. So the Najashi asked Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, what do you people say about Isa alayhi salam and Maryam alayhi salam? What do you say? So Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, he just continues where he left off. He was reading Surah Maryam. He read about Zakaria alayhi salam and Yahya alayhi salam. Now the Najashi wants to know what the Muslims say about Maryam and Isa. He just continues where he left off from Surah Maryam. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. 
واذكر في الكتاب مريم إذ انتبذت من أهلها مكانا شرقيا فاتخذت من دونهم حجابا فأرسلنا إليها روحنا فتمثل لها بشرا سويا قالت إني أعوذ بالرحمن منك إن كنت تقيا قال إنما أنا رسول ربك لأهب لك غلاما زكيا قالت أنا يكون لي غلام ولم يمسسني بشر ولم أك بغيا قال كذلك قال ربك هو علي هين ولنجعله آية للناس ورحمة منا وكان أمرا مقضيا فحملته فانتبذت به مكانا قصيا فأجاءها المخاض إلى جذع النخلة قالت يا ليتني مت قبل هذا وكنت نسيا منسيا فناداها من تحتها ألا تحزني قد جعل ربك تحتك سريا وهزي إليك بجذع النخلة تساقط عليك رطبا جنيا فكلي واشربي وقري عينا فإما ترين من البشر أحدا فقولي فقولي إني نذرت للرحمن صوما فلن أكلم اليوم إنسيا فأتت به قومها تحمله قالوا يا مريم لقد جئت شيئا فريا يا أخت هارون يا أخت هارون ما كان أبوك امرا سوء وما كانت أمك بغيا فأشارت إليه قالوا كيف نكلم من كان في المهد صبيا قال إني عبد الله آتاني الكتاب وجعلني نبيا وجعلني مباركا أينما كنت وأوصاني بالصلاة والزكاة ما دمت حيا وبرا بوالدتي ولم يجعلني جبارا شقيا والسلام علي يوم ولدت ويوم أموت ويوم أبعث حيا ذلك عيسى بن مريم قول الحق الذي فيه يمترون ما كان لله أن يتخذ من ولد سبحانه إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيكون so he recited these beautiful ayat to the Rajashi about Maryam السلام, and how she was given glad tidings that she would have a son. And she asked the angel, she asked Jibreel السلام, how can I have a son? How can I have a child when I, I have not been touched by a man? I'm not married. And then Jibreel السلام, told her, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed. And this is easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he can give you a son without that son having any father. This is no problem for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Isa alayhi salam was born to his mother Maryam alayhi salam without any father. It was a miraculous birth. And when the people saw Maryam alayhi salam with this little baby, thoughts started coming in their mind. Look, she's not married. She has a baby. How did this happen? So she just pointed to her son she pointed to the baby and Isa alayhi salam he spoke to defend his mother qala inni abdullah atani al kitab wa ja'alani nabiyya i am the slave of allah allah has given me the book and he has made me a prophet wa ja'alani mubarakan ayna ma kunt and he has made me blessed wherever i am wa awsani bis salati wa zakati ma dumtu hayya and he has ordered me to pray and to give in charity as long as i am alive وَبَرَّمْ بِوَالِدَتِي And he has ordered me to be good to my mother. وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْنِي جَبَّارًا شَقِيًّا وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيَّ يَوْمَ وُلِدْتُ وَيَوْمَ أَمُوتُ وَيَوْمَ أُبْعَثُ حَيَّا So the Najashi listened to this. Listened to the 
beautiful respect that the Muslims have for Isa alayhi salam and for the mother of Isa alayhi salam, Maryam alayhi salam. And when he heard this, he was so amazed and he was so touched by it. And he said, Wallahi, Isa alayhi salam never said more about himself than what this revelation says. So he realized this is, this is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then some of those religious authorities around him, those Batariqa, they started getting upset. They said, how can you say that? How can you say that? We believe that Isa is the son of Allah. And this revelation that you're listening to, it's saying that Isa alayhi salam is the Abdullah. He is the servant of Allah, not the son of Allah. And then the Najashi kept saying, Wallahi, Isa alayhi salam never said more about himself, except that he was the servant of Allah and a prophet of Allah. He never said more than that. So now there started to be some type of fitna between the Najashi himself and the other religious authorities, the religious establishment. But the Najashi, after hearing this, he said to the Muslims, you are safe with me. You are safe with me. And he sent, he sent Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah and Amr ibn As back to Mecca. So they came back to Mecca empty handed and the Najashi, he believed in the Quran. He believed in the Quran, but he didn't want to make it open that he is a Muslim because he feared that fighting would break out and there would be a lot of bloodshed and there would be a lot of fitna. But privately, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu used to come to the Najashi and teach him the Quran. So he would learn the Quran, he would listen to the recitation and he would study with Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. Now some of the religious authorities, they realized that this Najashi is not the same anymore that his beliefs have changed. So they wanted to actually stage a revolt against him. They started to organize their people to start a revolt against the Najashi. And the Najashi, he prepared his army as well to fight against them. So there was actually a war between the Christians and the religious authorities of the Christians and the Najashi and his army. So they fought. And the Najashi, alhamdulillah, he was victorious. The Najashi won. And the Muslims who were living there under his rule, they were very happy at this victory, alhamdulillah. So the Najashi had accepted Islam. He didn't publicize it to the people because he didn't want there to be fighting and fitna, but he had accepted Islam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was informed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Najashi had accepted Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ was informed when the Najashi finally passed away, when the Najashi died, Rasulullah ﷺ received revelation that the Najashi has passed away. And the Prophet ﷺ prayed Salatul Janaza al Ghaib. He prayed the funeral prayer for the Najashi. Even though the Najashi wasn't present there, he prayed the funeral prayer for him in Medina. And this was one of the gifts that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during that difficult year, the Islam of the Najashi. The fact that the Najashi became Muslim, alhamdulillah. Inshallah, after Ramadan, we will continue with the seerah lessons and we will talk about the next beautiful incident that took place in the 10th year of the prophethood and that is the Isra and the Mi'raj, one of the most or perhaps the most amazing event that ever happened in the history of mankind. Inshallah, we'll speak about that after Ramadan bi-ithnillah. Wallahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.